David's now going to talk a little bit about uh, delivering a big data-driven project at the ONS um, using Microsoft microservice technology as an architecture. Um, I'm going to hand over to David. Well, I've um, spent the last two or three years of my life in Wales, um, which might sound like a bit of an exile, but actually it's been, been a lot of fun. Um, living around kind of Cardiff and Newport, working with the Office for National Statistics. Um, the, I'll sort of put together a fairly, a little bit of context, a little bit of story, hopefully a little bit of humour, hopefully no one will get offended, there's one or two little clangers in there. Um, I, I have a sort of general agreement for ONS to talk about this stuff, so you know, do take it a little bit with a pinch of salt, and you know, hopefully with a smile. Um, but generally what we've done for ONS, they, were, they just had a lot of trouble with technology and technology culture, um, and they were very keen to sort of just think differently, change the culture, change the technology, and they've kind of embraced this microservice idea, um, which is certainly very fashionable at the moment, so it's a case of, okay, never mind the fashion, but let's look behind that. What, what does it do for you? What doesn't it do for you? I think we're probably okay to talk about this. So all the code is on GitHub, so anyone can go and look at it anyway. So they're very, very open about what they've done. Um, it's all on, on blogs, so it shouldn't be a problem at all. Um, and I think for, for me, what, what, I've, what I've learned through that process is that you know, it's the context and the story, um, and it's the design. So it's about thinking about what's your context? What are you designing for? You know, what are you actually doing? There's no point doing what someone else did because your situation is different. So it's about saying, okay, let's bring in some ideas, let's reevaluate them and decide what works for us. So um, something about the ONS story. So the, it is a piece of the national infrastructure. It's the, to quote the website, the UK's leading producer of independent, official and national statistics. So this is driving policy decisions, it's driving civil society, it's, you know, the, the numbers that these guys produce underlie a lot of the mechanics of how the economy and politics and society works. So it's, it's no small feat to make sure that that stuff is done properly. So they are very risk averse. They, they have a, an extreme desire to keep their statistics consistent, which is what you would want from any statistical time series to be able to compare across time. If you've got kind of disconnects in there, that's a real problem. Possibly the irony of working in a statistical organisation for two years is that I've never met a statistician. So you occasionally see them around and they're these sort of mythical creatures, but um, we were very much working in all the kind of the enabling technology, all of the stuff that kind of underpins that, and somewhere in a room people are producing numbers. So before you can move on. So the, um, the ONS was getting a lot of bad press. Um, I think the, the FT actually dedicated a bunch of prime time column inches specifically slagging off the ONS website because it was so bad. Um, I, it was a, I think it's fair to say it was a classic IT project, um, overcomplicated, over engineered, brittle in production, fell down on the first day, staff couldn't publish, people didn't know what was going on, staff had to keep going in and clearing caches and poking queues and doing all sorts of strange things to keep this thing running. And it had, it had reached a point where there was an outright ban in the organization on making any changes to the website at all, except for publishing data and security patches, because it had become so unwieldy. So there was a lot of drive to say, how can we be simpler and cleaner with our technology so that we can actually run it in production? Um, you know, we've had it with all these complex designs and all these fabulous ideas. Why don't we do something that works? Um, so I, I guess I kind of walked into that perfect storm where there was an appetite for change and I could bring in some new ideas. So <clears throat> I think GDS take a lot of the credit. Um, so I don't know how familiar people are with the government digital service, but they uh, passed the cabinet office and essentially were able to, I think it's fair to say, get a lot of power in government to say no to IT projects. So they really started forcing government departments to think differently, stop spending 100 million pounds and start delivering results. So they brought in um, a mandate to do things like agile, like open source, all the things that government was not good at before. Um, thanks to these guys, it's now become kind of a no-brainer. Um, I think that's really, really exciting and, and no small credit to them. Um, we're also lucky that even in the last three years, 
um, some of the changes in technology have been astounding. So the whole DevOps thing has really just exploded in the last few years. Um, Docker didn't really exist two, three years ago. So some of these things enable you to automate on a scale that was never previously possible. Um, just transform what it's possible to do with technology. They also transform some of the tipping points. So um, perhaps a, a traditional view in technology is that you should always reuse things you've built. And that depends on a world where it's expensive to build things. But the cheaper it gets to build things, at some point it's cheaper to rewrite than refactor. And where, where's that tipping point? Have we reached it? I think we probably have, but a lot of that comes down to how you design and use technology. So um, I've got a real beer in my bonnet about agile architecture. I think I've, it's probably fair to say I've been an architect, um, whatever that means, since about 2005. Um, I've worked on big government projects, you know, done the months of documentation. Nobody ever read them. And when we actually came to build it, the thing fell over. And everyone in the team is just sitting there going, we could have built this thing two times over. We could have prototyped it. We could have actually learned in practice and tried some things out and got some results. Um, but of course, in those days, the right thing to do was to go through a lot of documentation, a lot of formal processes, and keep away from kind of practical uh, hands-on technology, really. So there's, um, I think, some of the, some of the things that are, are starting to come out, like the idea that software is now OPEX, not CAPEX. So you don't do a project to build a thing that lasts 20 years. You develop a minimum viable product, and you continue to live with it. So it has to evolve. It has to move with the world. It's living in a changing environment. It needs to be changed. So there's a, there's a very, very fundamental principle that says, you know, if change is the only thing you can predict, then that should be the first thing that you put into your architecture. So if your systems can't change, um, and again, this is about context, it, it might be the, quite the same in your case, but certainly in, in the ONS's case, you know, if, if their systems can't change, if they can't keep moving, if they can't keep accommodating a business that is getting more and more ambitious, that wants to do more and more things, and that wants to change what it's doing, so um, just step outside that for a minute. The, the ONS, um, not everyone knows, but they, they collect almost all of their data using paper surveys, which are posted out to people. They process hundreds and thousands of surveys. They have an extremely efficient machinery of people and scanners that send out questionnaires, get them back, and try and get enough results to then produce national statistics. Um, in a sort of possibly a slightly more modern world, you'd say, well, Half of that data you could get by connecting to HMRC or going into an API company's house. You know, getting that data to start flowing automatically, you can reduce the burden on uh, particularly businesses who are legally mandated to fill out this stuff. Businesses, that's the Trade Act 1947, must provide data to the ONS. If the ONS can get it and become an observer rather than someone who has to go banging on their doors and demanding their time, that's a really nice change. So you can sort of see the, the organisation is kind of almost completely changing its operations from a really efficient paper world to a world where data is going to start flowing automatically around the economy. And ideally, they become an observer rather than a, rather than a, a sort of Schrodinger's cat kind of opening the box on every business and finding out what's going on. So we'll move on from there. So um, same company, see the text in the middle. Um, absolutely fundamental to what we did was iteration. Um, so... Um, this is what the website looked like when we arrived. Um, slightly cheeky, but I, I don't think they would disagree. Um, it was not a pretty site. And they had about 5,000 nodes of navigation. And the search was so clever that it returned so many results that you could never find what you were looking for. So um, all of the feedback from their users, and, and they really did go out and talk to people. And every time it was, I can't navigate it, I can't search it, so I can't find anything, so I don't know what's going on. So it's kind of pretty much the basic things that a website should do, which is give you the information you're looking for, were not possible using the existing website. Um, so I think we initially started with an, uh, just an alpha project. So it was a three-month rapid <coughs> prototyping. So we were pretty much every two, three, four weeks, we were doing user research, changing what we built, putting it out again, taking it out for more user research. So it was this kind of very rapid cycle of iteration. 
So, um, keep going. so this is where we started in, and this is where we got to in about week two. Now we were quite fortunate that they'd spent about a year um, doing user research, sorting out their information hierarchy. They had a lot of stuff ready to go when, when we arrived on the ground. So basically we arrived in a couple of weeks, put this up on Heroku, so we instantly had a website that people could click through. And this was absolutely revolutionary for the organisation. They'd never had an IT project that delivered something in less than a month. Um, they, you know, typically they were waiting one, two, three years before they saw anything, and at, and at that point it was maybe as good as what this would have been after a month. So this real sense of shortening the feedback loop, reducing the cycles, and constantly changing your course correcting so that we could, because we didn't, you know, nobody actually knew what the right answer was, so the best thing to do was to come up with an answer, test it, change it. So about a few weeks later we got to this. So there's a little bit more colour, um, we've got some, some nice headlines here. Um, we took this out to user testing, people said, you know, great having the numbers, really like the, so can we go back a couple of slides? So you'll notice that on the original website, go back again. Oh, uh, no, we need to go backwards. So on, on the original site, there were no key numbers. It was really not obvious what was going on with the economy. There was a lot of text. So you might just be able to squint and see there's a few numbers here that are quite interesting. So part of the idea was um, bring the numbers out front and center. Then we took that to the users and they said, love the numbers, really great, need context, right? Just because it's 71.5 percent, has that gone up or down? So next iteration, we started creating, probably hard to see, but um, what we call spark lines. So these are just very small graphs that allow you to see kind of how that number's changed over time. So you're starting to see the entire statistical time series with just a little bit of context. So we we're kind of learning as we we're going, and um, the ONS people, you know, they're going out, they're visiting the Bank of England, the House of Commons Library, you know, the BBC. Reuters, Financial Times, we're going out to all these organisations that rely on this stuff and have to use it day to day. And they're very fortunate to have a, a very passionate and constructively critical audience who are able to say, that's not going to work for me because I need X or Y. So if we step on, so we, um, this is where we got to the end of Alpha, I think we just jazzed it up with a few colours around the edge. Um, but this, that went out as sort of a, a public user test and that was out over Christmas 2013 and uh, just the response was was just brilliant. The, you know, the team had worked really well, we'd come up with a beautiful product um, and the people who were actually going to use it were so excited to see this for real. And the, the amount of kind of pace and traction that that established for the delivery of a technology project um, which you know previously perhaps you'd have gone for three years and come out with something and then people would be like that's not what we really needed. Here we were three months in with something that people were really excited about, and that's you know that kind of real sense of agile iteration, and we'll go into a little bit more about what's going on on the back end there. But the, this you know this was kind of revolutionary, and uh, I think what I'm trying to get at is it it was a complete culture change from the way that uh, from the kind of received wisdom of best practice of how you do IT. This was quite a strong departure for them. Um, we built so we built the beta site. Um, Onka here redesigned the look and feel. So again, we've still got kind of key numbers, but we've got slight more tiles here, a um, little bit more engaging. And then if we click on again, then the, so this is what we've actually gone live with. So if you go to ons.gov.uk, you'll see something like this. Um, what I think is really interesting is that they've, since February this year, they've been able to rewrite pretty much everything. So not only did the system deliver on time for a fraction of the cost, a far more value, but it was able to keep changing. So the team that took it on were able to live with it, work with it, and really productionize it. Because and, and this was very much just a, a minimum viable product. This is what was needed to kind of say, yep, yeah, we've changed. We put out a new website. So if we move on from there, so I like to kind of call myself out a bit. You know, a website, great. Other people have done good websites. So what, what actually, you know, what's actually really good about this? Um, and we'll, we'll come on to sort of the microservice part um, a little bit later. So if you dig behind the ONS website, so you go to any URL on the ONS website and you just tick slash data on the end of the URL, you will get the data underlying that page. So 
everything that the ONS does is now available <laughs> and machine readable. So some of the feedback they got from people at the BBC was, we don't want a website. Reuters don't want a website. They want to be able to connect to the API and get the data. They don't want someone have to go there to read it, to interpret it, and then to transcribe it. They'd much rather go to it directly. So, and it was, and I, I think the, yeah, the, the overarching message, message was we wanted to put the data front and center. So it's, it's a website about data that didn't present data. The, you know, the original user journey was down about six nodes of hierarchy to find a spreadsheet, to download it, to look into it, to find out if it was what you wanted. Now you can find, you know, you can get that answer at the start rather than at the end. So the complete change in user experience. So let's talk about architecture. Okay. Not my style. <laughs> so, okay. So um, I think of this more as technology design. So I've moved away from the idea of a solutions architect or a technical architect. Um, I tend to call myself a tech lead now. Um, so this is more about someone who has that kind of fundamental hands-on understanding of the technology in order to be able to design with it and work with the team to get the results. Um, and I'd, I will always come back to simplicity, but it's hard, it's really hard to keep things simple. Um, so really this idea that it's quite hard to be simple and, and a lot of that is about um, selling the concept, saying to, you know, saying to an organisation, yeah, we're not going to have a database. And they're like, are you really doing the right thing? And having that conversation going, okay, for the following reasons in this specific case, because the website is a collection of JSON files, it doesn't actually need to live in MongoDB, why would we not just put that on a file system? Um, one of their requirements is to be able to publish um, all of the data that's been scheduled to be published a year ahead within 60 seconds on the day of publication. Now, sometimes they're sending over a gigabyte or two, hundreds and thousands of small files. So they were, they were basically never able to meet that requirement before this came along. And because it was completely file-based and managed to get some nice publishing mechanisms in there, it was able to sort of pump all these files across in parallel so that the website, I don't think they've ever missed their publishing deadline since this went live, which is you know, a complete change for them again. So let's talk about microservices. So the typical system, you know, I've got loads of these, one ring to rule them all, the one system that will run the entire company, your SAP, your IBM, your you know, insert any name there. So what we're trying to get to is we're trying to sort of break down the idea of one big monolith into a bunch of kind of coordinating and collaborating chunks, as it were, and make those chunks a little bit independent. Um, now, this, the word microservice kind of tends to get you thinking about very tiny, tiny services, and, you know, and certainly there are people, um, talk to people at Companies House, you know, they got right down to the point where a service might just be 10 lines of code and it did just one tiny thing. Um, but what you find is that the more services you've got, you've kind of, you simplify your code, but you vastly increase complexity in production because you've got thousands and thousands of things trying to work together. So probably not a good idea to go too small if you're looking at breaking things up. Um, you're kind of looking for a Goldilocks place. So you're looking, and, and this is where the kind of, you know, the context and the story really comes in is, what are you actually doing? What is your domain? What, what are the parts of um, the work, the job to be done, the, you know, the specific thing that needs to be done that can sort of logically sit together. So um, something I'm working on at the moment, we've managed to um, come up with the idea of breaking out uh, a user login. So a user will go to one service to get their login token. They'll go to a second service to get their permissions, if you like. And they'll go to a third service to get a to-do list of items they need to work on. So starting to look at, you know, because actually you wouldn't want your code in the login service or the code in the to-do list service to somehow accidentally have access to user credentials. It kind of makes sense to separate those and, and draw them out and you know, create that sort of HTTP divider between chunks of your system. So I was trying to think of a metaphor for monolith to, to microservices. Um, I think this is this is where monolithic systems end up. There's you know there's so much complexity. The whole thing is all tied together, 
um, you know, everything's everywhere. There are no real boundaries between the different parts of, of what you're building. Um, and you end up with sort of, you know, graphs like this, even for relatively simple systems. So what we're trying to do is break out that complexity. So each chunk still has some complexity, but because the complexity is combinatorial, um, each one of those is much easier for a small team to manage and look after for a new developer to come in and understand that whole code base. Um, and where you've got very clearly defined HTTP interfaces, you can say, okay, I know exactly what the uh, expectations and requirements of this service are. So user login service, I take usernames and passwords and I give you an answer. And if I give you a security token, you can carry on. So that's a very clean statement of what the responsibility is. Um, it makes it very easy to, doesn't make it easy to design, but it, it makes it a lot clearer and more focused to design one of those components. Where the complexity is going to come in is getting these things to talk to each other. I like to think of it a little bit like a fleet of drones. So if you've, if you've seen some of the, the more interesting drones, they're, they're kind of self-stabilizing, self-managing. Um, if you had a whole fleet of them, you could lose a few and you know, the whole would continue to run. So it's kind of slightly more resilient, um, slightly more forgiving potentially, but you do have to be very careful about you know, if one of your components goes crazy and starts firing out too many requests, all those other components need to go, whoa, because you know, otherwise suddenly your whole system gets overloaded and you know, we talk about cascading failures. Now that really only tends to happen where you've, where you've reached a certain level of complexity where there are quite a lot of services working together. So someone like Netflix will have a lot of very interesting client-side client load balancing, server-side load balancing, circuit breakers, exponential back-offs, so that they can, they can be kind of deploying any one component into their environment, knowing that even if it goes wrong, the rest of the system will kind of continue to operate whilst they roll it back and, and put the old component back. Um, it, uh, the pets versus cattle is slightly brutal imagery. So um, if you have a pet, you look after it, you take it to the vet, you stroke it, you make sure it's okay. If you have ca cattle and it get, one gets sick, you probably shoot it and buy another one. So this idea of immutable infrastructure, immutable artifacts, you build it once, you deploy it many times, if it goes wrong, you get rid of it, you deploy another one. So in a, in a world where you've got three or four copies of one particular part of your system running, one of them falls over, you don't really mind, the system's monitoring it, sees that that one's gone, starts up a new one, the whole thing keeps running. So you know, trying to build in some of these ideas of, of graceful degradation. Um, it is difficult, it's a different class of problems, you know, that kind of coordination, um, that sort of slightly more forgiving model where you don't really know whether your network request succeeded, you're never quite sure what's going on, you never know when something's going to disappear on you, um, which is very different from when you're running in a monolith. In, in, you know, in some ways, that's a lot simpler because it's all in-process calls. You're just talking to the system. But when the whole system goes down, you lose everything. So you know, this is about saying, OK, can we, can we disaggregate that a bit? And actually, if, you know, if I need to update my user login, I'd like to be able to update that without having to release the entire application. I'd like to be able to add a, you know, new features to my permissions model without having to deploy the rest of the system. Um, so yeah, so I think the, the idea of independence is very attractive. The idea of the size of it, you know, drastically reducing that kind of combinatorial complexity of each component. But take into account, you know, you, you're going to have to do a lot more continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, but that's a good thing because, you know, if no one is touching the production servers and it's all done by robots um, and, you know, and the tooling is getting quite good for this, then you know that it's done right, you know it's consistent, you know it's repeatable, you can log it. You, know, you can actually get an awful lot of um, the kind of rigor that we'd like um, without actually requiring the, the human effort every time to deploy that right. You know, if, the, if the industrial revolution automated physical processes and you know, released huge value because people no longer had to manually plow fields, now if you don't manually have to deploy all your systems, you know, there's, a, there's a whole new layer of value being released there. A um, little bit fluffy, but it's worth kind of bearing that, that idea in mind that 
automating physical processes and then automating information processes. What now that you can move information kind of infinitely at zero cost, what opportunities that gives you uh, that you didn't have in a world where you had to print things out, courier them around, move paper. So I'd love that food for thought there. Um, if I haven't completely confused everyone, um, I'll probably leave it there. I've got a, a bunch of slides about kind of sort of um, some of the kind of team culture that made it all possible. Um, if you're interested, I'm quite happy to talk about that because I think that's um, I think the dirty secret of technology is that the hard problem is not technology; it's people, um, and getting people working well um, is a uh, well. It's usually seen as a black art, but I actually think it's very simple. Um, so I'm quite happy to share that, but this is a little bit off topic. Um, over to you.